It is my distinct privilege to welcome Professor Joshua Rubangoya of Roanoke College to offer today's lecture. In addition to his numerous articles and writings, Professor Rubangoya is the author of the provocative book, Regime Hegemony in Museveni's Uganda, Pax Musevenica, published with Paul Grave Macmillan. As Rubangoya outlines, it is a study that a study about Africa's most disturbing political deficit, namely the failure to restore legitimate authority in the post-colonial state. Of the book, one reviewer noted, quote, Rubangoya has written the most thorough and penetrating analysis of the regime of Yawairi Museveni in Uganda to date, end quote. A second review in the International Journal of African Historical Studies echoes similarly. This is unequivocally an important book. It is rich in detail on the twists and turns of Uganda politics under Museveni. Today, Professor Rubangoya has graciously agreed to introduce us to his current book project with a paper entitled Electoral Multi-Party Autocracy movement politics and democracy in Africa, the Uganda case. Following Professor Rubangoya's lecture, the discussion will be moderated by none other than Dr. Moses Kisa, the distinguished co-chair of the Uganda Studies Group and professor at North Carolina State University. And he joins us today from South Africa, where he's a visiting fellow. In addition to his numerous articles, Dr. Kisa is a regular contributor to the Daily Monitor, offering what is, to my mind, some of the most critical and insightful commentary available to us on contemporary <laughs> Uganda politics. We will aim to limit today's conversation to 90 minutes. And without further delay, please join me in welcoming Professor Rubangoya to the digital floor. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, John and um, Moses. I thank you for organizing this forum and for the work you do um, as uh, co-chairs. I want to extend a good morning and a good evening for those of you who are joining us from the continent. And I'm, I'm honored to be um, presenting this today. You all um, have become unwitting reviewers of my manuscript as it, um, as it evolves over time. So I'm, I'm hopeful that after my remarks, there will be um, a vibrant discussion of this. Um, but this is a work that um, has been going on for a while. When you teach at a liberal arts institution, uh, the time for research is uh, a bit limited. You squeeze it into all the teaching that you do. Um, but it's, it's been an exciting journey uh, thus far. Uh, permit me to share with you uh, as a guide, uh, my um, uh, PowerPoint slides here so that we can kind of look at this together. And um, as John suggested, this is the, uh, title of my talk today, it's not necessarily and automatically what may be the title of the book, but I'm dealing with um, these, ver these variables in talking about electoral multi-party autocracy as a regime type. And I'm talking about movement politics, not necessarily in the context of Uganda alone, but as a phenomenon that I observe to be uh, prevalent on the continent as a whole and then connecting them to uh, democracy uh, on the continent. The genesis of my work actually stems from uh, Joran uh, Haydn's work um, that I got the privilege to read and even to use the textbook for my classes. And in African politics in comparative perspective, he has a chapter in there that um, earlier on he had started um, talking about barriers to party systems in Africa, the movement legacy. And what struck my imagination was this notion of, of the legacy, of the movement legacy. And his contention was that political parties in Africa 
acted like and were organized in the form of political movements and that this was a legacy from early nationalist struggles which today block the emergence of party systems. It's important to note that he talks about political movements, not social movements. And I distinguish that or I emphasize that because it also will later explain the deficit of democracy, given that these are more political than social. Later on, I think a couple of years ago, I presented uh, my early work at one of the Miser colloquia in, uh, at Makerere University, at which the notion of movement legacy was challenged. Uh, the key point being uh, that, in fact, this was a colonial legacy and not a movement legacy. And that distinction was made, perhaps not surprisingly, given that uh, we were at Miser and um, uh, Mahmoud Mamdani was in the audience as well as the director of, of the center. So I have also then kind of understood this to be really in the context of the colonial uh, project and the colonial system and called it the colonial legacy. I, my modest contribution here, and I really call it modest, is that after the Miser Colloquium, I set to examine A, the nature and character of Africa's political parties in the context of this legacy, the state of democratic consolidation in light of such organizational structures, and relatedly, I found myself face to face then with the multi-party electoral autocracy um, as the regime type that underpins this form of rule, and then thirdly, Uganda's experience as an ideal case from which to glean generalizations that might be applicable um, to the rest of Africa. So I came back to the United States after the Makere presentation. I asked my student assistant to make a cursory search of how many parties had the word movement in them uh, from independence to the present. And I was really surprised there were very many parties, at least um, over 50 uh, parties that had this word movement in them. Not that that necessarily described the structure, but it gave me um, some kind of, uh, it propelled me to continue in the search for um, this puzzle that had started with my reading of Joran Haydn. I want to share with you then the main arguments that are driving my research at the moment. First argument is that Museveni was not in fact the first to practice a mode of power based on movement politics. Most post-colonial parties, and I put it in quotes because again, I'm struggling with the notion of these are parties, but they are really movement in both organization structure and behavior. But most post-colonial party, post parties have in fact been political movements. The idea of so-called no party democracy was in fact what I call movement politics. And it's in its mature stage, it exists even in a multi-party dispensation, thus giving rise to uh, the EMA, uh, EMA regime type. In historicizing this style of rule, it's clear that the currency of movement politics dates back to the days of Africa's independence struggles and these anti-colonial movements grew out of a dialectical opposition between nationalists and, the Briti and British indirect rule. So they morphed into the early political parties, but the movement element remains salient. And it's key to note again, to emphasize this, that even in the nationalist era, very few of these movements were actually social movements. Uh, they were political in the sense that their, their content and their support was oftentimes top down with um, urban based, uh, middle class, relatively educated people coming in to organize and let's so mass based, peasant based. So these are the two arguments that I'm making in addition to two others. Um, well, I guess before I get into the other two main arguments, let me also at this point stop for a moment and share with you um, what I believe, and again, using the taxonomy borrowed from, um, uh, borrowed from Haydn, how we can make this distinction between political movements on the one hand and uh, social movements on the other. Uh, this becomes a very important aspect of, of, the, of, the, of the 
of the research because the distinction or within the distinction lies the basic arguments that I'm making, i.e. why democratic consolidation or even transition to democracy is difficult when political party organization structure and behavior is more on the basis of political movements rather than uh, our typical understanding of how um, political parties behave typically. Let me go back then and um, try to get us to that distinction. I'll share with you a table here in a moment. Mm, please bear with me here just for a moment. Trying to get the table on. You have to stop sharing in order to start oh. sharing again. Oh, yes, thank you. <laughs> okay, here we go. So what I wanted to then share is this table that some of you have seen. Those of you, I do see some of us who were at um, the colloquium at uh, MISA, and you'll find this table familiar. Let me... Um, identified it here. And I had it all organized nicely here, but <laughs> it's always a Murphy's law. Always the case, yes, always the case. Right, exactly. And you're kind of like, where is it? Um, no, that's not it. Well, all right. I think we're close to finding it. Share. No. Oh, shit. Um, and I can see it here, but then what am I not doing right? Okay, I, I, I beg your pardon, can, can you see it now? Uh, no, it's just black. I think it's because you have a- oh, We got uh, it, we've got it. Oh, you've got it, okay, great, great, thank you. Table so, so, one, right? Table one, right. So this is an important illustration of what is going on in, as far as the research is concerned, that if we, if we look at these movements relative to parties, we find that movements typically will orientate towards pursuit of a cause rather than a campaign of issues. So we are going to find that if you track, is it big enough? Should I expand it? No, it's good. It's good, okay. So we're going to find that when we look at the trajectory, for example, of the Museveni regime since 1986, we'll find that the, the, the politics has been driven mostly by a cause. And I'll explain that a little later. And then the level of operation, um, is usually at the regime level. Government and the formal institutions usually are in place as formalities, but much of what goes on in terms of the politics and the decision-making, et cetera, happens at the level of the regime. The main arena of operation is usually society. And that's why mobilization is the method of operation. Campaigning is informal, uh, when it is formal, it is really secondary to mobilization. And we find that even in the very early stages of the NRA in the bush, this mobilizational form of, or, of operation was the underpinning to the, the, the beginning of the, the, the campaign in the bush that finally allows for the capture of state power. We've seen what has happened in our parliament 
And if you, if you kind of track that down, there was a moment where parliament had some kind of traction, but when you look at it in the, in the broad scheme of things and you look at it in its historical context, you find that much of the main arena of operations at the level of society. And then member orientation is diffuse as opposed to specific. Um, you'll notice that during the entire period of no party politics, what was going on at that point was everybody is in the tent. Um, and it is assumed everyone is operating at that level so that there's no specificity in terms of party orientation, party ideology, even in some instances of, of this membership and ownership of a party card and identity, et cetera. And then this question of claims to resources where movements generally have no formal limits and yet parties might be constrained by the rule of law. Um, this, these, this distinction or these distinctions, the distinctions that I'm making, I will argue later, are inimical to democratic transition because parties have to operate within this, the, within this column here, but also more importantly, they have to allow for the, the competition of an other while movements want to absorb, swallow, and mobilize completely the entire, um, uh, as many people as possible within the same tent. And that leaves a very limited room for competition, political space for civil society, formal or informal, political space for party competition. And, and, and that therefore um, is, is, is the thrust of my discussion concerning uh, democracy or democratic transition. So having made that distinction, I hope the next two arguments will make sense. Argument number three, that just as movements seek to mobilize and sweep as many people as possible into their orbits without regard for comp competition, so do movement parties. And therefore I'm categorizing this, uh, the, uh, the NRM uh, or NRMO as a movement party and its proclivity, therefore, is to act as a total organization without much regard to competing others. Uh, the resulting hegemonic dynamic tends to asphyxiate all other centers of power. And then the fourth argument I'm making related Joshua, to this, Joshua, may, Joshua yes. may I request that you, you share back the PowerPoint, I guess, uh, if you may oh. have forgotten doing that. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Now I have to find it. <laughs> um, it has a tendency to disappear. Where is it? I think it's something. You might have too many screens open. Either that or my system is, I should be able to scroll through though. Um, Mm. Should I close the screens first? Yeah, you can close some of the fans that you've opened. You should yeah, help. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's see what happens now. I still can't find it. Ah, here we go. So are we together now? Just not quite. Yes, now. Okay, great. So these are the other two arguments that just as movements seek to mobilize and sweep as many people as possible into their orbits without regard for competition, so do movement parties. And that's the NRMO's proclivity to act as a total organization without much regard to competing others. Uh, the resulting hegemonic dynamic, I argue, tends to asphyxiate all other centers of power. And then related to this, I have found no evidence to suggest that opposition parties are any different. And I spent some time making this argument that they too are creatures of the colonial legacy and thus exhibit similar movement characteristics. And what I'm planning on doing in the later chapters is to especially examine an interesting phenomenon when you observe the NOOP, for example, 
and um, and uh, how it behaves, and even the the the, the general arguments and campaigning that um, uh, uh, Chagulanyi does, you find that the, the, it's a it's 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 a movement. And by the way, the word movement is used in 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 some of his speeches to suggest we are a movement. And again, I'm arguing that opposition parties are in the same category here, and they too are political movements uh, uh, rather than social movements. So. In, in essence, then those are the four arguments I'm making uh, in, the, uh, in the book. Actually, there is the final one is four. And, and then the final one is that the colonial legacy therefore underpins a path dependence of sorts. And this was in the abstract. It's an, there's an, it's an increasing returns form of path dependence in which the costs of charting a new mass-based democracy are too high for the elites to bear. And what I'm finding is that the relative benefit of the current regime type compared to a popular democratic orientation increases over time in relation to the perceived cost of exit or of switching to some previously plausible alternative. Um, and so I'm borrowing from the theory of Pearson here who writes uh, uh, an influential article on, on increasing returns, but using it in the context of uh, political science rather than economics, which is, it is more uh, prevalent. Thus, no matter what regime type exists at any one time, autocracy remains firmly rooted in, in its underbelly because of, of, of this established path dependence with roots in the anti-colonial nationalist uh, period. So I have a couple of propositions as, as, as I conclude the, the, the manuscript and uh, give way for conversation here. Um, as I was writing this, it occurred to me that it would be somewhat lacking if I didn't have some kind of understanding or at least a discourse, or at least the beginning of a discussion of how do we get out of this? How might the path dependence be broken? Um, and the first, I looked into Ugandan history to try and find uh, models where we've had mass-based uh, social movements that have a democratic content. And I went into the, an examination of the post-war popular struggles of the mid late 1940s. These were comprised of peasants, workers and oppressed nationalities, including women and youth, uh, these anti-colonial early stirrings were tended to embrace a popular nationalism as a, as a form of democratic struggle. And for a while, they were autonomous, bottom-up popular organizations. In an earlier, article written by Mamdani, he argues that these in fact were wedded to and organized in the form of bringing about some kind of social transformation from below. The content of these organizations was democratic in that they sought rights and citizenship for the subaltern and for the masses. Of course, there was a colonial response. And so the colonial response was both ideological and political. First, politically, there was a legalization of trade unions and cooperatives. And so in legalizing them, they were co-opted into the orbit of the colonial state and thus essentially uh, their, their capacity to articulate democratic demands was thus cut short. But also, the colonial state then developed what is what we might call a state nationalist ideology to replace the popular nationalism that was, was, was driving these nationalist struggles. And so this ideology that the state then develops, the state, I, the state nationalism of the colonial state uh, tended to delegitimize the popular nationalism um, as, as, as sectarian, as alien, as, as criminal, in a certain way. However, there is, uh, I, I'm finding and I'm trying to articulate that there are seeds in this form of organization, 
that might give us a sense of a model for which or from which um, the path dependency that I have just described might be broken. But these struggles also leave another lesson to us. And that is why they were, why sustaining them was so difficult and why um, it was easy to fragment and then for the state to reestablish itself. Model two has something with the, the, the mobilization of, uh, of the NRM during the early Bush war. Uh, here, what we see the NRM do, and, the, and with the NRA, of course, is to forge an alliance of popular classes, uh, kind of cutting across nationalities. Um, the establishment of peasant bases in Buganda, and then the, ext the extension of this mobilization into Bunyoro, and the establishment of resistance committees, and I'm talking here prior to capturing state power. Uh, we of course see that after the NRM captures state power, this model of organization kind of um, falls along the way, and um, uh, the, 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 we, we, the basic analysis I'm trying to do here is why that takes place and why accountability from below is replaced by uh, local committees that then become top bottom rather than bottom up. They become representations of state interests rather than articulation of peasant based workers type of demands and therefore less democratic. So I'm going to be drawing some lessons from these two models. Finally, I hope to kind of map and um, have a discussion going on the relevance of this case study to other cases that have what I describe as movement parties, uh, beginning with our neighbor to the south in Rwanda, um, Tanzania, uh, the African National Congress, and um, Moses, you will give us more on that since you are there. And Professor Kasfer, you spent some time there as well. But I'm thinking that, uh, that, that at some point, especially with regard to these liberation parties, they gain and capture power. And instead of becoming vehicles for democratic empowerment and popular democracy, they then become huge political movements, top-down institutions that in, in essence throttle and, and, and squeeze democracy out. And so the key question is whether once there's a capture of power, whether these parties can become the very subjects of the democratic project itself, given that they are now in position of power. So ladies and gentlemen, that's, um, that's in essence an outline of, of, of what I'm doing. And um, I yield the floor to um, Brother Moses here to bring in uh, his comments and responses. Let me see if I can stop the sharing here. Thank you very much, uh, Joshua, uh, for as you know, I would have expected without any reservations, a brilliant and stimulating um, presentation, uh, which uh, is going to form the basis of our subsequent conversation. Um, I had mentioned in one email that Joshua is always very worth uh, listening to. And uh, as my young brother, he does not disappoint. Um, the problem though is that our parents, uh, you know, favored him a great deal and made him to become a famous professor <laughs> and uh, a very established senior scholar way, way ahead of me who is actually his big brother. Um, and so I feel very bad, but in this instance, I actually feel honored to be able comments uh, to the excellent uh, who otherwise is a bigger senior scholar than me. Uh, so I'll make a few um, quick comments um, and then um, I will we'll open up the floor to
questions, comments, and feedback from the audience. So uh, just hold on for a second, and we shall be having people raise their hands, uh, like what. Moses, your audio is in and out. Oh dear. Moses? <laughs> John, can you take over in the meantime? No, I can. I was I was waiting to see if he will come back in and then we could um, invite him to turn the video off for bandwidth. But why don't we for now turn to Professor Casper, who has his first uh, has his hand raised. So um, Nelson, we'll hand it over to you. Uh, thanks. Um, so Joshua, it, it's um, it's an exciting project. Um, I followed it from uh, before, no. as you know, because <clears throat> I've I've uh, worked a little bit with you on the project and promoting it to um, publishers. Uh, and uh, suggest making suggestions. I want to suggest that uh, the EMA concept, uh, electoral multi-party autocracy, is the wrong way to characterize your project. At least I want to raise that and have you uh, have you respond. Uh, and this wrong because contradiction in terms. Uh, uh, the notion of movement, as you're putting it forward, is all enveloping. Uh, there's no room for multi-party. Uh, autocracy. And anyway, multi-party autocracy is itself a contradiction in terms. Um, uh, what you really mean is that there are many parties that have a similar form. Each takes a movement structure. So I would say th that because the use of terms is important in leading readers or misleading readers, that you ought to uh, change that concept. That doesn't affect the concept at all. And as a secondary note, um, I think um, you need to go more into, I mean, you, you probably intend this anyway, uh, to go more into um, what a social movement would include in Ugandan terms. Uh, you do discuss this a little bit in talking about what happened in the colonial period and what happened in the early NRA period, uh, but to do a comparison between social movements and um, uh, what the, um, in Uganda at least, the NRA became later, um, uh, you might want to make a few comments here about comparing them. So two points. And perhaps before Professor Rubangoya responds, Moses is now back with us on audio. Um, Moses, we welcome you back. I have no idea, John, what happened, but somehow looks like I got kicked, um, kicked out. <laughs> and I realized I was speaking to myself. Um, so I, I, I guess I'm going to just to be on the safe side, turn off my video, my camera, and perhaps my, my connection will be a lot more uh, stable, assuming that is what caused the earlier, uh, earlier mishap. So I, you know, I was saying that you know, feel free to uh, raise your hand and then uh, I'll pick on you to make uh, comments or, or raise some questions. And I, I have just about three or four quick points I'm going to make uh, to my brother Joshua. And then we'll, we'll open it up to other colleagues who have some 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 issues to raise. So, so Joshua, you know, as I said, of course, you know, this is this is an important project, and you and I have talked about it before. Uh, I think it's very much worth pursuing. Um, so, I wanted to ask you whether you want to talk a little bit about the political economy that uh, reproduces the movement legacy. Because you know, you know, path dependence doesn't work on its own forever. There have to be social, economic, and political circumstances that uh, help reproduce, um, you know, a legacy that otherwise goes way back in time. And so, you know, what do you think in the context of a country like Uganda? Um, you know, the, the the conditions that make the reproduction of the movement legacy possible. And then I also wanted to ask you whether you are actually making a normative distinction here uh, between movement and party, uh, and whether that normative distinction uh, then leads you to draw certain 
you know, uh, implications, um, you know, is movement politics inherently um, antithetical to democratization, for example? Is, is that, you know, something you're trying to argue? Um, because then we can look for the evidence to either question that uh, proposition or, or validate it. And then lastly, I also wanted to ask whether you think this is germane and unique to the African context, uh, or whether indeed uh, the manner in which um, politics plays out around the world, perhaps some um, has, has this you know, tendency towards uh, move, movementization, if I may call it that way. And, and I'm thinking about recent trends, including in Europe and North America, where you know, populist movements have pretty much eclipsed, eclipsed um, mainstream political parties in ways that complicate matters as far as uh, democracy is concerned. So I'm going to keep my uh, quick comments at that uh, for Joshua, and perhaps we could take um, uh, uh, Professor mm -hmm. Anne Merekia on first, and then Joshua, you can respond. So Anne Meta, please go ahead. Thank you so much, Moses. And uh, also thanks, Joshua, for a really interesting and, and, and very good presentation. And uh, as Nelson, I've also been one of the people who have been allowed to follow this project a little bit on the sideline for a while. <laughs> and I think it's definitely worthwhile. And so I just want to expand and just say I thought you know, you, Nelson's comment was 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 a good one. And also I would like to echo Moses, but expand a little bit about the political economy underpinnings of, of movement politics, because I really think that it, that would be essential. I think, I mean, when Haydn introduced his uh, movement legacy and all of that, there was of course the historical and the colonial legacy, but it also very much I think was combined with a examination of the type of subsistence economy and, and the kind of effective networks that existed there. So I wonder whether that changed and whether your book will include an analysis of like political, social, economic dividing lines and how they might have changed through the, you know, especially in the NRM period, I suppose, and what kind of politics that kind of then mm -hmm. implicates. So in other words, did the socioeconomic conditions for, you know, having political parties change at all, or is it pretty much the same? And then also that will have, I suppose, an implication for the extent to which opposition parties differ. So I, I you know, from the NRM, so I would like to hear a little bit your, your thoughts on, on maybe elaboration is a better word on how opposition parties differ and how did you actually go about studying that? You know, so maybe in general, if you could expand a little bit on your kind of the methodology that you, you drew on uh, in your studies or are drawing on as you go along would be um, really useful. Thanks. Yeah, um, Joshua, you, uh, you can take on those uh, uh, questions and comments so far, and then we, we can uh, collect another round of comments and questions. Thank you very much. Um, let me begin with uh, Professor Kasper's comments. I appreciate them, and of course, I appreciate um, your your contribution to, to my work so far on the sideline there. Um, but you raise an interesting question, because what you call a contradiction, some scholars have called a hybrid. Um, so I think I, I think within the academic discourse that is currently going on, we are trying to sort this this phenomenon out. And in sorting it out, we have come with a hybrid regime. We have come come up with electoral multi-party autocracy, and, and so on and so forth. The whole point of, uh, of of my argument is that it begins with the notion that regular elections have been accepted by and large, notwithstanding what is going on in West Africa now, but that by and large, most African countries were and leaders were beginning to say elections have to be held. And so we have to figure out how to have elections, but maintain autocracy. 
And so, and hence the contradiction here that, that you point out, and you're right, I kind of have to sort it out, but I have to suggest that as, a, an, as, a, as, a, as academics and in the intellectual community, this is, this is the trick that there are regular elections going on, that we have parliaments that have opposition parties in them, but that at the end of the day, the transfer of power from an incumbent party to an opposition party rarely takes place. And so I'm going to be going back and thinking about how this movement element within parties might enable us to begin thinking about the African politics and perhaps coming up with a different way of, of, of the different format of analyzing what it really is. Um, and, and furthermore, whether it's really transitional uh, or whether it is here to stay. Um, so you, you, you point out correctly that I need to go into, a social uh, into discussing social movements and including and comparing the two. I think you mentioned social movements and political movements. Um, and, and I yes, I, I think I agree with you on that. And the table I shared with you was kind of part of that discussion. Um, and it is important, as you point out, because unless that is distinctly made in historical context, um, the argument itself does not quite hold uh, in terms of how it might lend itself to democratic transition and democratic consolidation. Um, and of course, needless to say, you and I will have some email exchanges on this beyond our discussion uh, today. Um, so thank you for that. Um, my good friend Ann Meta and, and Moses, you, you point to a very, very good point. In my fourth chapter, I'm actually tracing, especially with the Museveni regime, this whole trajectory from the period of structural adjustment to neoliberalism, and then into the current notion of, uh, of uh, uh, what, what is he calling it, um, nationalist development. So, they, um, so um, I am addressing that, although I think my presentation was short on that. I should have had a slide on that. But I'm looking at this transformation from the structural adjustment period, which is kind of the early period of Museveni's uh, rule, and then the arrival of neoliberalism and the role of the, multi, of the uh, World Bank, IMF, et cetera. And now um, the new phase, this notion of moving into what middle income and then getting away from the market as the main engine of growth, which was the which was the orthodoxy of the World Bank IMF neoliberal period, into the, the return of the state. As a matter of fact, and you'll be happy because I'm I'm I'm, I'm wrestling with um, Hickey's work on this, um, whom I know you've worked with very closely. But I'm looking at his 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 trajectory in terms of this shift. By the way, the shift also entails this notion of the Southern consensus um, as to bringing the state back in. And I have Scott Poe's book on my desk again to kind of revisit that. So you point to a very good, uh, you, you make a very good point. Uh, I think what I neglected to do was to include a slide on that in the presentation. But um, chapter four, which is turning out to be very long, um, is partly long because there's a political economy dimension to um, that which underpins this kind of, of rule, this kind of movement politics, and then the regime type as well. So um, uh, I hope it doesn't disappoint you when it finally comes out. <laughs> um, but thank you for pointing that out. Um, yes, Moses, I am making a normative distinction. I am making a, a normative distinction here. Um, and this normative distinction, me meaning that uh, movement politics is antithetical to democracy, is even further enunciated, or I nuance it, by bringing in opposition parties, which one would expect might perhaps break the cycle. But when I, when I, when I look at um, uh, NOOP, when I look at um, the Reform Agenda Party and others, I don't see them structured and organized in a way that returns to this point of how can we initiate, trigger, and stimulate the social base. Rather, if the leader of one party steps away, 
the party, so it's still personalist. It's a per, they are personalist movement parties, even in the opposition. And, my, and the normative point I'm making, and you point this out very well, is that democratic transition, democratic consolidation is going to be quite limited as long as we have this kind of dynamic. I think the last point you made is this germane to the African context. Um, again, a brilliant point here that you point out. I, I have to tell you that two years into the Trump administration in the United States, I realized that the Republican Party in the United States had been transformed into a movement. <laughs> Typical and fitting very well with the distinctions that I made on the table that I shared with you. And you're right that where the, the populist parties have become prevalent, the idea of having parties in the traditional sense rather than movements has itself been compromised. And so even with the departure of uh, Mr. Trump in the United States, we don't see, I don't see that the Rep Republican Party has moved from a movement dynamic back to its traditional ideological and, and, and philosophical foundations. That's why Trump continues to be a very important part of the movement. Um, and I don't even know whether we should still call it a Republican movement. It's, it's, it's a movement, all right, but we have to give it another name, maybe a Trumpian movement or something. And, and what I find interesting here um, uh, uh, in terms of our, uh, uh, of our discourse and that um, uh, Dr. Rebecca Tapscott also identified in her book is that we are no longer considering and taking African politics as an outlier. We are beginning to see that we, we, we can't romanticize Western democracy and say African democracy or African political systems have a, a problem of their own. They have to be treated uniquely because we are going to, we're beginning to see these general trends that tie the continent to the European continent, the North American uh, kind of politics as well. So um, uh, again, you, note, you, you raise the notion of populism and that indeed is what we also see in these personalist movement parties. Um, so th those are my comments, I think, because uh, um, uh, Dr. Meta's comments kind of dovetailed with Moses's in terms of the political economy dimension. Thank you, Joshua. I just want to quickly highlight a couple of uh, comments and questions that have come through the chat, and then we'll go to the uh, live, live speakers, starting with John. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, Professor Rosa Namara is the one who raised the question in the chat about sort of it's a, it's a counterfactual question for you, Joshua. Yes. Um, so what, what would we get if we had political parties and not movements? Uh, and then the second question has come from uh, Dr. Jimmy Spires in Tongo, who is asking whether um, all movements mean the same thing by movement. So, and, and I think it's an important question because, um, you know, was the, the movement for multi-party democracy in Zambia, for example, having the same movement meaning as the national resistance movement in Uganda? So when, when, when parties in Africa take on the label and the naming of movement, are they in fact you know, talking or working with the same meaning of what movement is about? Uh, I think that's what Jimmy Sentongo may have meant. And Jimmy, if I have misrepresented you, mis misrepresented you kindly do unmute and, and ask the question yourself directly. So I don't, I don't, I don't um, uh, mislead the audience on what you actually wanted to say. Uh, all right, so we, we're going to take a couple of more questions, uh, Joshua, and then you can respond. And we'll begin with, with you, John. Thank you very much. And um, thank you very much, Joshua, for a stimulating presentation. My question, I suspect, is about local languages and vernacular reflections. We know that from Chigezi to Karamoja and from Arua to Entebbe, throughout the 18th and 19th centuries, communities had ways of talking about and debating movement politics that was connected to ideas about migration and state centralization. Then surrounding the first and the second Are world- we frozen? Excuse me? No, Moses needed to mute his microphone. Oh, okay. Keep and going. then surrounding the first and the second world wars, ideas about movements often get reworked as debates about progress 
So I know, for example, in the Luganda press, there were large amounts of debate about kukulakulana, um, about uh, what it means to live in a kind of a progressive state, a progressive society. And so I think my question is, are there ways in which attention to local languages and how movement is being defined um, in a way that maybe uh, Jimmy Sentongo is also referencing can complicate the contemporary literature on movement politics? Um, is there something that we're missing from the contemporary literature and political science by not taking local vernacular conceptions seriously and trying to think about how those are actually changing over time? Thank you very much. I assume you don't mind if I just jump in then. Yeah, go ahead. Um, <laughs> just introduce myself. Um, so I just have a kind of half-baked idea or response. Um, first, I really like this, and I think it speaks to something that, you know, a lot of us who write about Uganda try to capture, um, which is, you know, easily said, uh, this imbrication, right, between... Um, politics and society and kind of how hard it is to disentangle a lot of the concepts that sort of Western political science relies upon to explain political activity. Um, but as much as it might be easy to say that, it's kind of hard to understand what's inside that box. So I love this project. I think it's really fascinating and I look forward to hearing more about it. Um, I guess my one kind of thought was about um, just how I think, like, again, coming from a Western political science perspective, there's this idea that with time, parties will emerge, right? And part of that is based on um, just assumptions about the relationships of efficiency, of communication, of kind of how people would want resources to be distributed. Um, and I feel like to some extent what your project promises to explain is how that those assumptions just aren't necessarily true. Um, and so much as we have a very different outcome in a country like Uganda than Denmark for historic reasons, we could end up with similar things in other countries. And so I wonder if part of what you're pointing to also is broader global processes that have changed what domestic politics look like in different places. And in order to explore that, obviously, it'd be necessary to sort of link um, kind of what the, what the dynamics are that are incentivizing one outcome or another. Um, but, but anyway, yeah, that's just kind of where my mind went with it. Again, a bit half-baked, but I think it's really fascinating. Um, uh, Joshua, there was a, a question that came through the chat from Professor Josefina Hichire. Uh, she's kind of re-echoing uh, my earlier comment about is, is movement politics inherently inimical to democratization. I think you can take up that as well. I should also mention that we have uh, one of the eminent former ideologues of movement politics in Uganda, Muse Ruzindana, who is with us. And uh, Muse, if you would like to chip in into the conversation, kindly feel free. Um, but in the meantime, Joshua can respond. Okay, uh, thank you all. Um... This question concerning whether, okay, let me first respond to the question of what kind of politics would we have if we had act, true legitimate classical parties? Number one, ordinarily, um, parties assume the existence of other parties. And because of that, there is therefore the acceptance of the other, of the opposition. There is an acceptance of a competition of ideas in the process of campaigning and in the process of projecting certain issues. Uh, normally there are ideological orientations that then help to frame the ideas, the vision, and, and thus uh, the process and style of governance. And so because of that, or let me say movements on the other hand, do not assume competition or the existence of an other, or, or although movements may be led by an ideological orientation, but the lack of, the lack of competition, the limitation of space, 
the adoption of mobilization as the main strategy of recruitment constricts the possibility of democratic transition and, and process. Um, notice the limitations on resources usually existing within the rule of law that, that parties subject themselves to, that movements do not subject themselves to. Um, the operation at the level of regime empties government as formal institutions to do the people's work. And that also is inimical to democracy. So that is the distinction I'm making. And I think that um, uh, I hope that also kind of responds to uh, Dr. Hikide's question um, that the movement itself has to reformulate. It has to reorganize and restructure institutionally to say that, yes, I recognize that there's another party and that it is through the contestation of ideas, both ideological and otherwise, that we get to present ourselves to the people and the people have a choice to make and therefore uh, their, 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 their rights, their, indivi their individual concerns get articulated in that way. So that is the, fundamentally the, the argument that I'm making. Um, then, John, your, uh, your question is too complicated for me. Um, I have I have not had I have I have not had the opportunity to look at 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 this at this question or these questions in the context of of local language and therefore local expression and how that might in the end fit into the context of what I'm discussing. But when I visit the countryside in Uganda, um, ironically, there is this notion of we are going with what is currently in vogue. So for instance, anybody who wishes to introduce, let's say an interest group, a party and so on, um, that is not wedded to the incumbent and that therefore might not reveal or even produce income or some kind of reward usually is considered to be a non-starter. So, the, and, and I, I don't know how this is articulated in language, but certainly there's language that suggests that aligning oneself with the incumbent party, with, the in, with whoever is in power, has both social, economic, and financial rewards. And therefore, there is a tendency in the, I, what I at least know cursorily about language is there's a tendency to say, to again, we go with those who are on the bandwagon of quote unquote progress. And progress is defined by where do I get economic social reward? And that makes it harder also, therefore, for alternative forms of organization to gain root. Um, and, the, and, and so that's why I, I go back to, sit to, to, to the early NRA, NRM form of mobilization in the bush and how that was done to kind of at least project the challenges that are involved. Perhaps also related to this is this question of political economy because levels high levels of poverty have a tendency to align language and support to the institutions or organizations that might be helpful in giving a, a, some kind of reward uh, in one way or another. Um, uh, Dr. Dr. Tapscott, I think you talked about politics and society and these, these kind of global processes that kind of impinge on domestic politics. I, I, Correct me if I've summarized it well, um, but in the so far, I I have I have the, the global connection in, in my work has much more to do with the financial institutions, um, the World Bank, the IMF, and other financial institutions, um, and maybe and maybe tangentially the connection between the Ugandan military. And, and military support from the United States. But I'm, I'm not quite sure that I've captured what, what you were trying to articulate. 
Yeah, I, maybe I can just briefly, no need to respond necessarily if you don't uh, feel it's yeah. interesting, but um, I, what I was thinking more is, so we've ended up with these different styles of doing politics, I don't know, styles, organization maybe of doing politics in different places in the world, right? And you're mm -hmm. articulating one in movement politics and we have kind of a different ideal type of party politics and other, mm -hmm. you know, global north parts of the world. Um, and you're pointing to historical reasons for why those have emerged the way that they have. But then of course, what everyone is uh, sort of saying is like, oh, but we're seeing populism in the global North now. And like, isn't that, you know, an interesting convergence? Mm -hmm. And that in some ways this suggests that essentially the conditions that allowed for those different types of political organization to emerge in different places in the world were contingent on that particular historical moment that allowed those to be mm. different kinds of places. And that as we're seeing different or maybe even similar forms of doing politics emerging across the North and South that might suggest you know, effects of globalization to put it very simply or bluntly, but, the, but, you know, again, unpacking that box, we would see a bunch of other things. That's kind of where I was going with that. Great. Thank you. Um, yeah, we, we, Joshua, we can take on a few more um, questions and Muzero Zindana has uh, yielded my earlier prodding and we'll, we'll take him on. Uh, but there's also a question that came through the chat from uh, Yusuf Serunkum. I don't know whether Yusuf can actually just ask the question himself well, so I don't mis I don't misrepresent him. But he's he's kind of asking why you think that uh, movement and parties should be treated as either or, uh, and and not as you know different political manifestations that uh, play out at different historical moments and circumstances, such that. Mm -hmm. You may well have a political party, which is a party, but you know, rooted in some movement, um, you know, manifestation for whatever it may be worth. But I'll, you know, I'll ask Yusuf to ask the question himself after Mzeru Zindana. Mzeru, you need to unmute. You are still muted. Please unmute. Oh, okay, okay, I have done it. Mm -hmm. Am I, you, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, fine. Now, uh, I was thanking Moses for having invited me to this lecture. Uh, I am not an academic, but uh, I do have a little experience in some of these things. Uh, some of the issues I had thought I would raise have been covered already. But what I wanted to ask the professor, uh, and which has not come out, is how a movement political organization is transformed by holding power. In other words, how the NRM uh, has become, whether it has remained the same or whether it has changed, because of holding power uh, for quite a, a bit of time, and, and whether uh, uh, and what happens when a party or a movement gets fused with the state? Uh, because I didn't see this coming out as to whether the character of the NRM has actually changed, and whether. Uh, 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 it is different in character now uh, by sort of being fused by the state with the state and, and uh, whether the autocratic element that he mentions uh, comes from being part of the state. In other words, for example, would the opposition parties, which are also movement, have the autocratic element, uh, which he, uh, uh, he mentioned. Uh, but finally, and uh, he did uh, talk about it a bit by comparison with the, uh, with the parties in America and, and, and elsewhere, uh, is the conservative party in the UK, for example, uh, a movement type of now did Boris Johnson transform it into uh, 
a movement type of, uh, of, of party or is it any different from the, the, the movement which is here and, and in, in some other place, some other places? And finally, is there a difference in character uh, between a political party that arises from an armed struggle and others that arise from situations that are not armed struggle, like the others which have been formed within the country uh, and, and, uh, and elsewhere. I have not read uh, anything written by Professor Rubongoya before, but I'm glad that I have been part of this, uh, uh, of this discussion. And I, I, I think I read the book when eventually it comes out. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Muzeh uh, Ruzindana. Uh, um, I think Joshua, the, you know, I, I, I just wanted to re-echo a little bit of what Muzeh Ruzindana was saying and add, add my own uh, question since uh, I can exercise a little bit of autocratic powers as the moderator for, for the session. Um, I wanted to point out whether you see a fundamental and qualitative dis difference between the movement of 1986 as a movement, new movement in power, and the movement political party since 2005. And, and related to that, I don't know whether we, we see a qualitative difference between multi-party politics in Uganda in the 60s, um, shortly after independence, and multi-party politics in 2022 today, given that you know, you're seeing this as sort of a, a continuous path-dependent uh, dynamics. But you know, uh, do we, do we you know, are, are, they, are these things, do, do things remain the same <laughs> over time, in other words? Um, so yeah, and then we have uh, uh, Professor Kasozi, please go ahead. And after Professor Kasozi, Yusuf, please feel free to unmute so you ask your question, assuming I misrepresented you. You are still muted, Professor Kasozi, please unmute. Professor Kasozi, you are muted, please unmute. Okay, uh, as we wait for Professor Kasozi to unmute and speak. Professor Kasozi, please know that we are not hearing you, assuming you are talking. Your audio remains muted. You actually turned off the camera, I guess. Oh, uh, Yusuf, would you like to? Oh, there he uh, is. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Professor Kasozi, go ahead, please. All right. Uh, mine is very sh short. Uh, normally, movements arise when there are social crises, which movements, you know, galvanize all their political and social energies to resolve, just as what happened in Uganda, what happened in Italy, what happened in other places. I would like you to, uh, to, to let me know where, what were the historical and social factors that enhanced the emergence of a movement system in Uganda instead of the political systems. And whether greed alone can explain the resistance to peaceful transfers of power in political systems or in movement systems, do they, do they show the same type of resistance? But we, I would like to understand the social factors first. Thank you. I'm finished. Well, thank you, Professor Kasozi. Uh, Yusuf, please um, ask the question so Joshua have, uh, gets you right. Go ahead, please. Uh, thanks a lot. I thought it was very clear in the chat. Uh, I'm just wondering, I think it speaks to what Professor Kasozi just said. I'm just wondering why you need to make that distinction. Right, because I think these are political manifestations that happen uh, in different political moments. And I had you cite Mamdani there, and I think Mamdani makes a very interesting distinction between parties and political projects, political movements, because political movements have a shelf life. They, uh, they emerge to respond to a particular 
question. I'm just curious why you want to kill the distinction and merge them and see them as the same. Uh, relatedly, you know, the nomenclature in Kampala uh, insists that they are political parties, right? But I, my sense as a scholar, I felt you would not be persuaded and blinded by the nomenclature uh, to continue calling them political parties. Perhaps you tell us there are actually no political parties in Uganda. Be, 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 and you make a very, the table that you struggled to show us earlier in the presentation, it makes a very clear distinction. So we have movements that have sustained their time and that failed to transform and become political parties, right? And although they claim to be political parties, so, and then uh, you, you start talking about a system calling itself a movement system, and we don't know what makes it a system, right? Or is it just because of longevity? You stay in power for too long, you become a system, as so established. So I'm just curious whether I'm not being persuaded and blinded by the nomenclature in Kampala, so that you're trying to make uh, a distinction and see how the two speak and enter into each other. Yet, as, as I think as well as has said, they are very distinct political manifestations and they emerge and die in different political moments. I have finished. <laughs> uh, Joshua, go ahead. All right, thank you. Let me um, begin with, with um, um, Zayru Zindana, who raises uh, some really interesting questions, and I, I can sense that they are coming from your own political experience, having been in the trenches and, and perhaps now retired. Um, the question of how a movement political organization is transformed by holding power is critically important because what I'm tracing in the analysis is what happens when the uh, NRA, NRM leave the Bush and capture state power and how it becomes transformed over time. This dovetails again with a question that, uh, that uh, Dr. Kissa was, was raising, you know, um, in, in, in the regime hegemony in Museveni's Uganda, I actually trace the history of this up to 1996. And I'm arguing then that any kind of democratic dispensation or even any effort to, uh, to attend to and respond to the demands of, uh, of, of, the, of the peasantry of the working class that were remaining after the Bush war actually end around 1996. And so, Yes, the holding of power does transform a liberation movement. And we see it in Mozambique, we see it in Angola, and we, we see it in, in Uganda where um, after 1986 and part of the power consolidation project, there is some effort to attend to and to preserve the social basis of the NRM. But it is, generally speaking, in my own analysis, that it is after 1996 that any pretense of that kind of ends. Why does it end? Again, you make a good point that when there's a transformation after holding power, when the resistance committees are transformed and become local councils, and the NRM and these committees become adjuncts of the state, then this notion of a social base to an organizing, to a ruling organization completely diminishes. Um, and so I, I hope that kind of responds to the, to the, to the, to the question you're asking. And so yeah. the analysis in, in um, I believe, yeah, again in the chapter, in chapter four, begins with this idea that what, what, what we have in the bush as a movement that is anti-state, anti-obote, requires the social base to expand because the peasantry and the working class within Buganda and then later within Bunyoro are required to help in a lot of ways this movement 
this anti-state, anti-Obota movement. Once in power, the vagaries of rule uh, and, and, and the transformation of governance becomes key. And once the consolidation project is completed, we see a different, a different animal altogether. <clears throat> I'm not sure, um, uh, Dr. Zindana, whether the Conservative Party in, in, in the UK um, has become a movement. Mm -hmm. I think the populism of, of Boris have been somewhat tamed by, by parliament, but we certainly cannot compare the Conservative Party in, in the UK with what happens in the four years and continues to happen in the United States with respect to the Republican Party. I think there's, there's, there's quite a difference. And then finally, you asked whether the difference in character between a political party from an armed struggle, right? And what, please, could you please, um, I didn't take my notes there well, uh, Mr. Zindana. Is there a difference in, in character between a political party from an armed struggle and a political party yes. that, does, that, does, that, that does not emerge from an armed struggle? That's correct. For example, right. CCM, CCM in Tanzania and Frelimo in, in Mozambique and so on. Right. Well, um, Frelimo emerges out of the armed struggle, does it not? Yes. Yeah, so so we can we can we can relate Frelimo to to NRM or NRM NRA NRM, you know. Um, but the, the the CCM is an interesting case. Now here's my argument that 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 is important in making these distinctions. My argument is that the experience of the nationalist struggle, although it is different in Uganda and in Tanzania, but I'm arguing that the experience of the nationalist struggle and the form of organization that was permitted by the colonial state and the fact that these were actually anti-colonial, not necessarily pro-democracy, but that these are anti-colonial movements, that formative period of the nationalist struggle then creates the base upon which political organization uh, kind of builds upon. It is the basis upon which these parties emerge and even though the nationalist struggle is not, well, we had the Maji Maji and so on and so forth in Tanzania, but, but we do see that they are really emerging from and have the seeds of the form of organization that is permitted at, uh, during the nationalist struggle and that become the building blocks of organization and therefore of, 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 of rule later on. So the question then becomes how that, those, that, that seed, how that, 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 that um, genesis can be overcome in order that the movement element is limited and political parties in their classic form are born. I might also add, by the way, um, and this is what, what I find significant about your question, that we, you, we, we see the Democratic Party in Uganda we see the noop in Uganda, um, but on what building blocks are they operating? And the oldest party in, in, in Uganda, the Democratic Party, when, when you look at it from, you know, for, in, in its historical context, in a larger historical context, um, does exhibit and manifest signs of, of, of more signs of movement rather than, rather than political party. And in the earlier time, this was, essentially using religion as the fulcrum of mobilization and of coherence. Um, let me move on to um, Dr. Kissa's question. Uh, definitely, I have a historical uh, chapter three that looks, and uh, by the way, it, it, it also echoes back to, to, to my book, but that looks at the NRM um, from 1986, 96, from 1986 to 96, and then from 2005 to 2022. And what I'm, what I'm tracing in that regard is to what extent the NRM becomes more and more of a political movement. In other words, the, the, the process of completely shedding its social base as it grows. Now, what happens in 2005 when no party democracy ends is this tendency to say, okay, we are going now to purge 
those who are no longer towing the party uh, or the movement line in this case. And so it becomes even more political in that sense rather than social. In other words, it sheds its social identity even further because it had to cohere and begin to really the campaign of, of having a fully um, uh, coherent and unified entity to contest for power. Um, so I agree that there are transformations and these transformations are a reflection of the politics that is prevailing on the ground um, during that particular period of time. So we see this concession. We, 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 are, we, are, we are allowing multi-party politics, but we are going to have a, a, a remove uh, ten, uh, terms, presidential terms. And we, uh, uh, all, the, all that debate is reflected in these transformations. D Professor Kasozi was asking, uh, I think you mentioned that movements arise out of the social challenges that exist at any one given time, right? Um, and, and then the question is, what are the historical social factors? If I'm correct here, right? Um, so again, let's look at the, the challenges that the NRM, NRA faces in its early phases of the Bush war. What, 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 is, what is needed under the circumstances? What are the material conditions? What are the social political conditions that give rise to and shape how NRA, NRM in the Bush is going to operate? There are logistical questions, but more importantly, it, it, there's a need to, exp, to, to have a critical mass. How do you recruit? How do you appeal to those that you recruit? And how do you ultimately create the, the kind of mass uh, party or mass movement that will enable you to expand, i.e. from Buganda into Bunyoro, and then ultimately uh, kind of galvanize, I think was your word, which is a good one, galvanize the kind of political uh, inertia to take power. And so there's a response to uh, the challenges that the NRA faces in the bush and the material conditions that prevail within the peasantry and the working class and other popular classes and popular groups within uh, Buganda and Bunyoro. Uh, and I, so I agree that there is definitely a response to that um, that is dictated by both practical and ideological mobilizational um, uh, uh, requirements and, and, and challenges. Yusuf is asking, I think this question, why make the distinction uh, Yusuf, are you there? Why make the distinction between political and social in terms of qualifying these movements? Well, my distinction also is related to the question of uh, democratic deficit and democratic transition. Because as long as the movement is primarily a political movement, which is what the NRM becomes after 2005 and beyond, and its social base keeps shrinking, then the only way to govern and the style of rule um, has to be top down. And the elements of autocracy therefore creep into the style of rule precisely because the social base of the party keeps shrinking as the, the, the movement or, the, or as the movement par party itself and as movement politics become adjuncts to the state. Because the only way a bottom-up democratic, popular democratic structure can be reconstructed or constructed is by continuing to appeal to the rights of the masses um, and to continue to massage the social dimension of the organization that is in power. And we see that at the more the NRM became an adjunct to the state, the more we see popular nationalism replaced by state nationalism. The more we begin to see organizations not forming as a consequence of the masses, but rather from the top, where sections of civil society are in fact dictated by and formulated by the state rather than allowing them to emerge from below. Um, and, and so the distinction is important in, in, in that respect. And, and no, I'm not, I'm not um, confused by the nomenclature in, in Kampala. <laughs> I am, I, I'm, I'm simply uh, being led by, by, by the, 
by both the normative and practical distinctions uh, that emerge out of the scholarly sources and my research in terms of what do we have? Um, uh, does Bobby Wine really lead a political party? The answer is no, because we don't, if we don't when, when was there a meeting of the NOOP at which the candidacy of who would lead it was put to the members of NOOP? When did that happen? It, it has never happened. Um, and the literature, the, 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 what, 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 what Bobby Wine himself has been able to, 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 to the statements that he has made uh, is a statement saying, this is a movement. We are here, and, and, and by the way, it is an anti museveni movement. I'm not sure that one can make a persuasive argument that it is a pro-democracy movement. So there is an understanding that what is in the way of democracy is Museveni, but there is no open discussion of what kind of democratic institutions and what kind of democratic system is to be set up. So I, 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 I would love to be challenged on the notion that NOOP is not an anti-Museveni uh, movement and a pro-democracy movement, because I don't see it in both the organization of NOOP, its structure, but also in its pronouncements. Now, uh, if we look at um, uh, the other political parties, the same, uh, the, the, I, would, I would argue the same applies to them. Yusuf, that, you, that's, you have, uh, Yusuf, yeah, you have a rejoinder. You, you, you look like you wanted to have another go at this. Please do. I, want, I just want to slot in a small question. Are you, is Joshua trying to argue that once they remain as movements, they are anti-democratic? Is that what you want to say, that if the movement is not democratic? No, no, no. I'm saying that if, 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 if it's a political movement, it is very difficult for democracy to flourish. If it is, how, how is that? If, 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 if it, if, okay, let me make the distinction even clearer. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm splitting movements between political and social. It doesn't mean that a political movement can't be a social movement, that both of those cannot, in fact, um, around, uh, kind of um, intersect. But what I'm suggesting is that when it is a political movement, it is divorced from a social base. What I mean by that is that it is no longer appeals to, nor addresses the fundamental questions of the masses, of the peasantry, of the working class, of the, of the minority groups. When it is a political movement, it is run by an elite and elite interests become the main driving norms. On the other hand, if it's a so social movement, it is rooted in the rights of the masses. It is driven by a popular nationalism and that becomes the engine that drives it. So can, can both occur at the same time? Yes, but what I'm arguing is that in the case of Uganda, and in a lot of these um, movement parties, they are more political than social movements, and that that is inimical to democracy. So we, we are so therefore we are talking about the, uh, the extent to which the the, the 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 popular masses are empowered, the extent to which they are appealed to in terms of decisions and policies that are made, and then we are also talking about the content of not only the organizational structure, but the content of the basic issues that drive the institution. Is, are the, is the content democratic or political? Meaning, is it intended to only address entrenchment of the elite? Another interesting example in this distinction is as follows. If you look at, if you look at the resistance committees, these exist, of course, during the Bush War. They are run by, elected by, organized by the masses in the countryside due, before they, they captured power. When you look at local councils, especially at the upper echelon of these, it's a top-down. It's a top-down kind of system where we are looking at 
this is what the NRM wants and it percolates down. So if you look at the local councils today, they don't have a democratic content because they're getting dictates and, and, and orders and direction from the top. On the other hand, the resistance committees are organized by, for, and in the interest of the masses. I mean, my, my guess is that um, more and, recent... and by the way, and, and by the way, Moses, bef... yep. uh, forgive me for interruption here. Sure. No, I'd, no, like to, I would like to get your contact, Yusuf, because this is a discussion we could continue. Given your body language, I think this is not going to end here. Okay, Moses. <laughs> Definitely, I was I was going to point out that we we are out of time. Actually, our time is um, is, is is up, and this this conversation definitely cannot uh, end now. It will have to go on. Uh, I think we shall have Joshua again uh, on this on this um, forum in the future for a follow up discussion. And there is definitely a lot of ground to cover which we haven't covered and so but but this conversation will have to continue um I, I wanted to just quickly point out uh sort of to illustrate joshua's point uh the recent uh, manifestation of what he's talking about is precisely the bobby wine phenomenon so people power movement begins as potentially a social movement uh i think in its um initial incipient um stage it, it, it seemed to come across as a potential social movement. Before it could become one, it quickly transformed into NUP and, and moved away from, you know, uh, attempting to be a movement to becoming, uh, attempting to be a social movement, to becoming neither a political party nor a social movement, but actually a political movement in the manner in which Joshua has articulated what he means by a political movement. Um, so, I, I mean, I think, you know, NUP and People Power Movement in some ways uh, very much vividly illustrate and illuminate Joshua's um, conceptual distinction and, and the analytical framework he's, he's producing. I mean, we, we ha actually have to go, but Joshua, there were a couple of um, last uh, comments that came through the chat. I'm going to see if I can pick uh, one or two of them quickly and then we shall wrap up. Uh, I think David Timba was uh, raising a question, Joshua, which you addressed earlier about uh, what, what you have to say about uh, CCM in Tanzania. Uh, his other question in the chat is quite long, so I'm not going to read it. I'm actually going to ask uh, David Timba to uh, um, unmute and ask the question himself. But uh, David, we're out of time, so ask your question very briefly in one minute. And then Thanks. there's other question in the I chat. Guess, I think from... I don't have a question, Moses. Uh, I guess hang on I'm a good. second. Huh? Hang on a second, David. Uh, David. There's another comment from Dillon. Dillon, I hope I said the name well. I hope I did not murder the name. Uh, that is also a long question, so I'm going to ask the person to ask uh, by himself or herself. But David, go ahead uh, briefly, please. I mean, I am, I am, I'm really sympathizing with the Joshua because um, we are all in this uh, kind of conundrum. So mine is not a question. It's just uh, Joshua, Joshua has, is, is giving us a binary so that to sustain an argument he has. And, uh, and, and he, dichotom he dichotomizes um, social and political. And, uh, and, and for a phenomenon under scrutiny here, um, that can be sustained uh, for the sake of the argument. But I think, uh, unfortunately, it doesn't do really justice to the phenomenon under scrutiny. So I think the, the challenge remains, how do we as scholars of the political formations, how does an African scholars in, 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 in the current moment we are in really theorize a phenomenon which, which, which refuses to be captured in the binary analytic? That, 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 that's that invitation. That's, I think, the real intellectual challenge of our times. Thanks. Yep, and, and uh, Joshua, the other question in the chat, which I was alluding to, the person is asking, you know, do movements um, outlast their founding leaders and ideologues? So can a movement go beyond one generation into another generation? Um, I think you can briefly and quickly respond to that along with David Timber's uh, question, and then we'll wrap up. I think David is more is more well versed with dialectics, so I'm going to leave that one there. <laughs> um, uh, but sorry, Moses, what was the last what was the last question? Yeah, the person was asking, <clears throat> do movements um, 
<clears throat> outlast their founders? Uh, can can we have a movement go past one or two generations? Um, and let me just look at the question again. Yeah, I think that's really the crux of the question the person was asking. Right. Does the inevitable aging or phasing out of, of founding generation lead to transition to a more traditional political party? So yeah. Is it, is no. it possible that you know you can get a political party uh, across generations? I guess your answer is no, because you know CCM in Tanzania and others have been cross-generational. Exactly, and in fact, there is somebody who, um, there's someone who does raise the CCM uh, uh, example. But yeah, Moses, I agree with you that um, it's, it's very difficult. As a matter of fact, the CCM after Nyerere um, uh, continues to shed its social identity. And um, we can look at CCM today as, as perhaps trending towards political rather than social uh, in terms of its identity. All right. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we have to end it here. It's, it's been a great honor and pleasure for me and my colleague John uh, in organizing this. And we thank you all for taking the time to join us uh, in this very stimulating and engaging conversation. Uh, we would like to thank especially Professor Joshua Rwongoya uh, for um, you know, uh, doing the presentation and helping shed light on very important uh, question or set of questions. Uh, we hope to do this again. Um, next month and the months that follow. And if you'd like to present and speak, uh, do get in, in touch with me or John. Um, you can write to me, or you can write to John uh, by email and we'll be happy to schedule a talk for you if you'd like to make one. Uh, again, thank you very much. And I would like to ask uh, all of us to, um, you know, give a round of applause to Joshua for, you know, um, you know, this, this very, very important presentation. All right, and good luck and, and the best to everybody out there. And good luck to you, of course, my, my young brother, Joshua. We we'll look forward to reading the book uh, pretty soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much.